Together. Go, yeah! Woo! We are the Beatles! Give Big Great London! <laughs> Afternoon, church. Welcome. Let's praise God. No longer I who live, now Jesus lives in me. Let's praise God, let's worship the King of Kings. Arise, my soul, remember this. He took my sin and he buried it no longer. Oh 
control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promise to be. Yes, 
It's our second birthday today. Yes, it is. Well, it's, not, it's our celebration of our it second is true. birthday. That is true. It's celebration. Yes, yeah, so we've already eaten lots of cake. That's not right. because it's our birthday, just because. No, just because. Just because. We're, we're in lockdown. It's comfort <laughs> food. All right. We're fine. We're fine. We're all good. Welcome. White's meant to welcome. be slimming. If this is your first time here, a big welcome. Uh, I'm Jenny. I'm Mike. We're the pastors here at Encounter Church. And such a blessing to be with you to celebrate two years of church. Jen, it's been an incredible time. It has. Like it's been, it's actually been ridiculous. But maybe we'll talk about it that Sunday night live. Tune into that eight o'clock tonight. But um, why don't you, you tell me what's your highlight? If you could just pick one thing over the last year, what's your highlight from 2019? That That's birthday a year. Good question. It was it's it was a great year, awesome question. year. I think for me, Christmas, um, Christmas Day in particular, we had our service on Christmas Day, yeah. and we had about a hundred people there, and it was just going off. Everyone was just praising Jesus and just so excited to celebrate Jesus' birthday. And I've never seen Christmas Day so joyful and so excited. And for me, that was just. I mean, I have I have three kids, but that was exciting. But never like in. <laughs> I've never worshipped God like that. It was fun. It was really, really fun. So it was it, a huge highlight for me. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's good for us as a four o'clock church to know that we can get that wild at 9.30. <laughs> so what well, that means, we can be prepped and ready and excited when we launch our morning service later on in the year. I think for me, uh, one of my big highlights was our camp, our church camp, mm. which was just, I called it peak community. The exact moment of peak community was when we were gathered around the campfire, sharing stories, hearing testimonies of God's faithfulness among us, for, of new people who have come and found community, found hope, mm. found a future because of the way Jesus has been working through the people here at Encounter Church. So that was a big highlight for me. That was really cool. So so if you have not been here for any of these events, I encourage you, why don't you try connect in with us and then you can come along to these, these events, come along to our camps, come along to our life groups. We've got so much stuff happening here at Encounter. So in a, a little button just above you, there'll be um, a little connect button and um, I'd love you just to press that and connect in with us. We'd love to know who you are and, and how we can plug you in here at Encounter. Yeah, totally. That'll let you fill in a virtual connect card and it's really, really simple, but it's our first step to connecting you in with life groups and with the life of the church. It's a really powerful and profound step. So I'd really encourage you to plug in that way. But another way you can plug in is by making sure that you turn up next week. That's half the battle, friends, is turning up next week. And next week we are launching our brand new series. It's called Heaven on Earth. It's about the Lord's Prayer and breaking that down because because it is the way Jesus encouraged us to pray. And in this COVID moment, it's been so important for us to lean into prayer in a new way, in, a, in, a, in an yeah. e- example. It's, it's something that we're really pressing into. We call it contending in prayer. And so for the next six weeks, we're going to be breaking down the Lord's Prayer and how that applies to you and your personal relationship with God. So I'm really excited for that. I'm excited too. It's always a great opportunity when we start a new series to invite a friend. Yeah. So I just want to encourage you this week, why well, so do you think good. about inviting somebody to this brand new series so they can connect? So I know that over the last couple of weeks, you guys have had your ears glued and your eyes glued, either or, and listening to what the government's been saying about um, some of the restrictions. <laughs> Are you gluing your eyes? I'm Are you trying gluing to glue your eyes. eyes? 
Um, and so we just wanted to let you know a little bit about what's been going on here at Encounter when we've been hearing those news and that kind of thing. Um, so, Mike, do you want to tell us a little bit what's going to happen um, in the next couple of months? We'd love to. Uh, we as a church, as you might know, South Australia is not changing a whole heap over the next month. We've changed a little bit from this week. But we as a church are not going to change any of our practices until June the 8th, which is when Phase 2 is anticipated to start. So on June the 8th, we have two exciting things that are happening. We are going to switch from just watching church in our own homes to what we're calling watch parties. We want to encourage you guys to gather in groups of up to 20 as is appropriate for your space. Obviously, all the social distancing rules are still applying. 1.5 meters, one person per four meters squared, 10 donuts per person attending, that sort of thing. And we want you to, at least two of those are accurate. And We want you to make sure you don't watch church alone if you can possibly avoid it. I know for some of you, you you still got health restrictions personally, and we totally understand that. But if you don't, and you can gather with other people, we want you to do that. We want you to join a watch party because we are better together. What's the other thing we're doing, babe? We are going to be going back to in-person life groups. Um, Yes. We are also going to have the option of Zoom as well. So it won't just be in person. So if you can't make it um, or perhaps you've joined a group and you're interstate, you can still continue on in that group. Um, But for those who are able to, and again, with space, looking at space and things like that, um, we're going to go back to in-person life groups, which is really exciting as well. So we're looking at how we do that. um, There'll be more information coming out over the next few weeks as we get it as well. Um, But we're really excited for um, the future. 100%. And and the advantage, of course, in being able to switch to this model is you get to gather around with your friends if you're able to. But if you're in a rural area, I know we've had lots of people from rural areas plugging in, you might want to consider uh, what it looks like to have life group in your own home. You might want to plug in digitally and start zooming into one of the groups here in Adelaide City or you might want to start one in your own home Mm. and we'd love to chat to you about that because this is where it starts we're a church of life groups not a church with life groups Mm. it's it's a critical part of who we are so we'd love you to really press into that right now Uh, and now we just want to come to a time of giving before we uh, throw it over to what we've got next Um, Jen do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, in a moment, we're going to listen to some testimonies um, about what God's been doing in people's lives. And one of the things in my life that I have found that giving um, has been an act of worship for me. Giving has been something that's actually really grown me and helped me uh, not hold on to things that I feel like I need in this life, but understanding that actually God is all I need. And so when I give each month, I don't, um, I actually don't have an automatic debit that comes out. I do it every month. And I do that because I want to pray over my giving. I want it to be a, an act of worship towards God. And um, Um, Some months are harder than others to give, if I'm honest, Um, but I always know that God is going to provide for me and every time he does. When I put him first, he just, he he, um, gives us all that we need. And so I just want to encourage you today. Um, We have some giving details on the screen and we'd love for you to partner with us in this mission. And we'd love you to, uh, when you give, see it as an act of worship towards God and, and, and it comes out of an overflow of gratitude personally for me. It comes out of an attitude of saying, actually, God, you deserve all that I have, not just 10%. You know, that we give you, you actually deserve all of me. And, and and so that's a part of how I worship and giving. And so I just want to encourage you, um, we would love you to click on that button or to um, jump onto our website and have a look at the giving t- details and just ask God, what is it that you want me to give? What is it that I need to sacrifice and to say, actually, God, here is everything. Here is all I have. Have my life. Take it. Do what you will with that and see how he comes through. See how he provides in so many different ways. So we're going to pray over the giving and then we're going to hear some stories from some people about the way in which God's been changing their lives. So why don't you pray with me? Father God, I thank you that you give us all that we need. I thank you that when we come before you humbly and we give, Lord God, we are not just um, giving money, Lord God, we are saying that we lay down our lives before you, that we know that you will provide and that you will give us all that we need. So Lord, I pray that you take this money that comes in this week and that you multiply it, Lord, and may we use it for your glory, Lord, to see people come to know you, to see lives transformed, to see ministries transformed in this city, in this nation, Lord. Father, we pray for those right now that are in um, other countries right now that are struggling to even put food on their table. 
Lord, I thank you for the gifts we have given and I pray that you will uh, provide all that they need, that you will use us and the overflow that we have, Lord God, to be a blessing to them, Lord. So, Lord, we want to give you honour and praise and glory for all that you've done in our lives, Lord God, and we ask that you continue to move powerfully in this whole country of ours, Lord God, and all over the world. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, why don't you turn with us to the screen, and uh, we're just going to watch some testimonies of God's goodness. Hi, guys. My name's Josh. Um, I've been in Canada for about 12 months now. Um, I think that probably the biggest thing that I've been challenged in the last 12 months is being open to the Spirit, being open to what God has in store for the church, being open to what God has in store for me in weird ways. Um, it's a very foreign concept to me, uh, especially from growing up in a bit of a different background. Being open to the Spirit might seem a bit weird, um, but that's something that I've definitely been challenged on. Uh, in that, like, pressing into the Word, pressing into God, again, has been another massive challenge, a massive foot, uh, footstep for me. I'm going to read you a passage from Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. That's what Paul wrote in Philippians. Christ took hold. We need to press into God. And that's something that I am going to continue to do. And that's because of encounter. I'm going to read another part, another short little passage from Colossians 2, uh, verse 6. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and over, overflowing with thank, thankfulness. Just as you receive Christ Jesus, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted, rooted in God. And that's what I want encounter for the next year to be, rooted in Christ. And if you're not sure, you know, you're, you're stumbling or you're challenged just by what's going on, root yourself in Christ. And that's what I want to encourage you guys at Encounter to do. Root yourselves in Christ because that's where good things are going to happen. You'll press into the Word and then all of a sudden weird things will happen and you'll become open to the Spirit. All right, thanks guys. Hi, my name's Adelaide um, and I'm one of the interns at Encounter. Um, and I've been at Encounter for the past eight months. Um, and I sort of came to Encounter from um, a situation from my previous church that left me a bit heartbroken from church leadership and yeah I moved into Encounter um, not really wanting to even go to a new church, not even wanting to find a new church and I was a bit over church in general, um, didn't really want to trust leadership or even trust other Christians um, but as I came to Encounter and as I kept meeting the Spirit in worship um, God just healed my heart and I began to love people and actually trust leadership again. Um, and as I've pressed into Encounter through internship and getting involved in a life group, I've seen the way that God has just grown me. Um, you know, I used to have a faith where it was okay for me to just come to church on a Sunday, listen to a sermon and leave. But God has grown me to love Him so much deeper than that since I've been at Encounter. And my life is just transformed because of that. My faith is so much deeper and um, I have so much joy because of that. Um, so yeah, that's how Encounter has shaped my faith. <laughs> so today's teaching text is from Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus by his death Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him, for our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make them clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. 
Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep His promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. This is God's Word. Well, Encounter Church, welcome to your first Sunday of Lockdown Light. Our nation is on a path out of the COVID-19 epidemic, out of lockdown, and hopefully into something approaching normality. And can I tell you, God bless Zoom, but I have extreme Zoom fatigue. I'm, I'm well and truly over it. Has anybody else felt like they were going slowly crazy as they stare at a screen or like they're really just staring at themselves while they're in meetings with other people? Uh, Yeah, that's just me, I'm sure. Zoom has opened up our worship, hasn't it? And it's opened up our homes. And I'm incredibly grateful for the way God's been able to move and minister to so many of you during that time. But can I be really honest? I don't like it at all. I, I hate it. I find it really hard. I don't like doing digital worship personally. I find it incredibly difficult to engage. I find myself easily distracted. And so if that's you, I just want to speak to you now, not out of condemnation, but just out of encouragement, out of solidarity. I I get it. I'm with you. And I actually think tonight, as I preach this message, it's a message that's going to help us come out of lockdown, out of that lockdown mentality and into a place that is new that God wants us to go to. So can I just encourage you, really really try and focus just for 20 minutes or so as I share this message with you tonight. Because the message I want to share is a message called Come Together. Everybody say, come together. Comment in the comment section, come together. Come together. That is the heartbeat for us tonight. You probably picked that up already. Love that the team did that song for us to begin with because today is our birthday and we are celebrating that even though we're not physically together, we're moving that way in the future. And we're celebrating that this is the thing that God does. He brings people together. He brings people together with each other. He brings people together with Him. And so as we approach normality, as we approach the ability to praise God, actually physically come together, We just want to talk about what it means to come together tonight. And we're going to dig into the scripture that Alec read before from Hebrews. But I just want to pray before I do that. And and I want to pray in particular, just know that my heart's with you if you've been particularly isolated during this time. And my prayers are with you. It's been really difficult. We are on a path out. Take heart. Take courage. We're going to come together. Let me pray. Almighty God, who has been three in one since the beginning, you know unity, you know togetherness, you know what that means, Lord. It's in your nature. We just long to come together with you right now. Oh, Father, we pray for an encounter with Jesus tonight. Lord, don't let us leave here the same as when we came. And when we sat down for worship tonight, Lord, you you know as well as anyone, more than anyone, how detached we can get. Lord, tonight we just ask, would you speak to us? We're listening as best as we can. We are listening right now. Would you speak to us in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Well, let's dig right into the scripture really quick. Because in Hebrews 10, in the reading we heard today, the writer of Hebrews reminds us of the critical importance of meeting together. He says, Don't give up that habit. Don't miss out on coming together. And I love that. It is so critically important. There's no such thing as a Christian all by themselves. You've got the body of Christ throughout history informing you, the saints. You've got peers all around the globe, and we were made for community. You can't do life alone, friends. When we do life alone, our lives don't look like Jesus. They look like our version of Jesus, a little tiny little mic-shaped echo chamber because there's nobody else to reflect the image of God to me. There's no challenge to my growth. But Hebrews is not just saying come together with other people. It's saying that we don't just come together that way. We come together with God, with God. God in all his fullness, and it is surprisingly simple. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. They tell us to draw near to God, to hold tight to the knowledge that our hope is in Jesus and to encourage each other toward love and good works, which is an act of love anyway. And we can do this, says the author, 
because of what Jesus has done for us. The writer of Hebrews says that Jesus has created a new and living way to reach God and has torn the veil between us. And if we're going to understand what Jesus has done in our lives, if we're going to understand how to come together with God, we've got to understand the veil. This metaphor is important, church. See, for centuries, the Jewish people were separated from the physical, tangible presence of God by the thick veil that separated the holy place of the temple from the most holy place, the holiest of holies, uh, the place partitioned off by the veil in the temple where the presence of God was said to be. Now, only the, holy, uh, the high priest could enter the holiest of holies. And only the high priest could do that once a year. And they stood to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And only then, after the high priest had been ritually purified, it was a process. It took a minute. But the priest would need to stand then and sacrifice the next year. And again. And again. And again. Because the veil was still there. The gap between us and God remained. This priest was serving as that boundary for just a moment. But it was an imperfect priest offering an imperfect sacrifice. But in comes Jesus. And Jesus fulfills many, many functions. But one of his functions is he is our true high priest. Did you know that? Jesus is our real, true high priest. And so rather than making a series of great sacrifices and chucking a goat on the altar or a pair of doves or whatever, he instead becomes the sacrifice on our behalf. He lived a purified life, holy in the eyes of God and other people, what we call righteous, not self-righteous, but righteous, and took upon himself the sins of all the people, cleansing us from sin once and for all. So instead of needing to stand and offer repeated sacrifices, Jesus is seated, seated in glory at the right hand of the Father. He doesn't have to get up every year and offer another sacrifice. He's done it, church. He's done the work once and for all. The life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus has made a way for you to know God in full, to have a relationship with him now that will last into eternity. And if you take nothing else away from this message, know this, God has moved heaven and earth. He has died just so that you would know the love that he has for you. That's how important it is. So the veil at the end of this, after the high priest himself becomes the sacrifice, after Jesus lays himself down for us and is taken up on a cross, there's no more standing around. He's now sitting on his throne. He's resurrected in glory with God the Father. And the veil after this is torn from top to bottom. And we are given full access into the presence of God, not through a dead sacrifice, but through our living high priest. Now, that's good, but there's more. Because when the veil is torn, what we get, friends, is all of God, all of God. And this is good. This is what we want. But all of God is frightening. This is the same God that when Moses begged to see his face, was like, you can't see my face. I will let you see the train of my veil as I go past you. I'll hide you so you don't perish from my glory. And Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and the other Israelites look away from him. They say, put a veil over your face because we are going to be blinded by the reflected glory of God on you. That's the power of the glory of God. All of God is frightening. And only a few verses later, the writer of Hebrews says that it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, the only thing more powerful than the sun, the stars, and all creation, the God who created the sun and the stars and all creation. The full presence of God is overwhelming. It is uncontrollable. And we get what we want, which is our full relationship with God. But when we come into his presence, we realize something, and that is we aren't equals. Moses, all he wanted to do was look at his face and God said, you cannot even do that. You will perish. That's how far apart we are. We don't get to stand in his presence and then go, God, hey, mate, I see you, peer to peer, you and I. I've got some polite disagreements. No, 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 no. When we come into the full presence of God, when we know, when we have that encounter with God moment, and if you've had something like this and you know, we are drawn to our knees in awe and worship of our holy God. That's the power of the presence of God. It's confronting. But whether we feel uncomfortable or not is not really the point. The point is the veil has been torn. 
Now, why is this important to us when we talk about lockdown and coming together? Well, here's why. The veil was torn so we could come together. And you and I, we've actually only been in lockdown since March the 20th. It's less than two months, even though it feels like an eternity, even though I could swear the only thing I have done in the last two months is hang out with my family and be on Zoom. And one of those things is driving me crazy, and I'll let you choose. But as it has not even been two months. It hasn't. And as of this moment, only one SA case in the last 20 days, this is great. We're on the path to going back to normal, to going to coffee shops and pubs and having parties and going to the movies and going to church, praise God, and going back to normal. But I've got a problem with normal church. I've got a problem with it. I'm worried about what normal means for your faith and for my faith. And I'm worried what normal might mean if we step back into it again with the same mentality, the same passion, the same learnings that we had before lockdown. The Australian church, friends, has been in full-on normal mode for about 70 years. We've been creating these systems of comfort that allow us to build a religion that will outlast the movement that began it. Can I tell you, we have become experts at creating a Christian system That doesn't need Jesus in order to work. That's what the Australian church has been on a pathway towards for 70 years. I've been a part of it. I know this. And here at Encounter, we've worked really, really hard from day one, consciously, to not be like that. To stay uncomfortable. Not that we have any special insight. We're just trying to learn from the mistakes we've already made. And so we've fought not to be overly institutionalized. We've fought not to be comfortable. We hold to a value of being real because God can only change who you actually are, not who you're pretending to be. And when we're real, we can speak truth. And when we're real in relationships, we can speak truth and love. And we can speak truth and it will land well. So let me hope that I'm speaking truth and love now and it's going to land well. Let me tell you, church, I am frightened that for those of you who are watching right now, that you are not going to remember the lessons of lockdown that you are craving a return to what you would call normal and what I would call apathetic spirituality. I am terrified that we will forget the lessons COVID has tried to teach us about where our strength and our purpose are. Because as we emerge from lockdown, we have two choices, two, about the kind of Jesus follower we are going to be. Option one, you could come up with a thousand names for it. I'm going to call it consumer Christian. Consumer Christian. And in this option, we continue to make church about middle-class Christianity. That is, we curate an experience that satisfies the desire to be personally loved and affirmed and upheld in my gifts and um, the experiences I'm having and our gifts and our finances. And we will give and we we will serve, but really only when it's convenient. And then we'll shut up shop when it's not. And I don't mean to mock that because that is the lived experience of most people who have been Christian for longer than 12 months. We know what it's like to slip back into that. Here's the second option. And this is the option Jesus is calling you to. Resilient discipleship. Resilient discipleship. We talk a lot about this at Encounter. In this option, we become passionate, vibrant, disciplined, focused Christians Not disciplined in a practice sense where we're bore answers, but disciplined when we say we know where our attention is. We know where our passion is. We become people who are visibly different because of what Jesus has done, church. Come on, you hearing me? And we consistently challenge ourselves to share our faith boldly. We become a people for whom courage is a necessity, not a luxury. And we share our faith not because we have to, but because God's goodness to us has been so good and our desperate need for him is so evident that we go, you need to see the God who has done this work in me. As the Samaritan woman says in John 4, come and see a woman, a man who has told me everything I've ever done. When we're revealed to ourselves in the presence of God, we have nothing else. We become a people who recognize that prayer is our essential function as Christians because without it, without the voice of God, Without the presence of God, we have nothing. That's resilient discipleship. Church, God wants more for us. He's teaching us to yearn for his presence, and he's torn the veil. He wants us to come together with him now as if we are holy and righteous because of what Jesus has done for us. That's why. 
Jesus has made the way for us. He's made a way for you and I to be in the presence of God, to come together with God. But here's the funny thing. Yet now you and I, we're the ones putting the veil up. God's given us access, yet we try and hold him at a distance. And I'm telling you this now because you haven't done this yet. We're not out of lockdown yet. We're still in that mindset where we're feeling needy. But let me tell you what we do, right? It's like we put up this veil, right? It's like this. These face masks that we've been wandering around and wearing and now we know are mostly irrelevant unless we're already sick. You see, it's like we're putting this face mask on. Like the presence of God is overwhelming. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. But we're putting this tiny little mask on. See, it's like we're perfectly healthy, but here we are, walking around like this. You've seen us wearing them. And we're wearing these tiny veils. The veil is torn, but we're wearing tiny veils to stop the presence of God from taking over our lives. We'll walk around and it's like, oh, God, take over most of my life. Not all of it, most of it. I've got to have a little veil up. God, speak to me when it suits me, and only then about who my future husband will be. Amen. God, pass my uni assignments for me and I'll give you partial credit. It is actually that ridiculous. It's as ridiculous as it sounds, but God has torn apart the veil. We can't play make-believe Christianity anymore. We can't do it. Why would we? Do something else with your Sunday. But when we walk around wearing a face mask on, it's like a metaphor for how we try and keep control in our life. And as I come to a close, I need to tell you this. We live our lives as followers of Jesus wearing face masks and telling ourselves that we're being faithful when what we're really doing is being controlling. Why? Because the presence of God is overwhelming and it's uncomfortable and we're not in control and we don't like that. We in the West are so used to being in control, but the lesson of COVID is we're not in control. We want to put measures in our lives of how far we'll let Jesus in. We'll walk into church, we'll serve on team, but then... We put these tiny little veils on to keep Jesus at arm's length. Not out of our lives, but just far enough away that we don't have to give up complete control. But when Jesus says, follow me, we follow with everything. We leave it all behind. And when we do this, the abnormal becomes normal. And God calls us to unusual and astonishing things. It's when he might call you to be a missionary or a pastor or a chaplain. But more likely and equally amazing and astonishing, more likely he's calling you to be a business leader. And you're trying to tell God, oh, God, I I didn't do well enough in school. I can't be a business leader. I can't influence for the kingdom in business, in the commercial sector. I can't make money for the kingdom. I can't do it. Or God's calling you to be a stay-at-home dad. And you're saying, oh, God, There's nothing wrong with that for other people, but it's not my dream. Uh, So that can't be from you. Maybe that's a different voice. Or it's telling you to stop drinking and you're saying, God, I'm not an alcoholic. And God might be saying, I didn't say you were. I just said you need to stop drinking. He might just be challenging you to share simply but honestly why Jesus is so important to you, to the people you love the most. See, the thing is, The little veils that we put up, the little pieces of control we try and hold, we think they're irrelevant. God might be calling you to fast, and you're like, well, I don't need to. God loves me already. That's not what he said. He's just calling you to fast. Do you know what I mean? It's the difference between a small bit of disobedience and full obedience. It's the difference between the full presence of God and trying to repatch up the veil with our tiny veils. Church, listen to me. As we come to a close here, The lessons we have learned in lockdown have to be lived in freedom. The lessons we have learned in lockdown have to be lived in freedom. We need to know, we need to remind ourselves that all we have is Jesus. Haven't we been taught that our jobs aren't as secure as we think? That our financial situation isn't as secure as we think? That even our capacity to stay healthy, and in the West we take that for granted, but we've lived in fear of our health for two months. We've never had this before in our lifetimes, unless you live through the Spanish flu like my great-grandmother. Bless her, she's still going. For the rest of us, we've never lived through anything like this, and we're afraid. We've been afraid. We've been out of control. 
And God's saying, finally. Finally, I can move. Because church, hear me. I can't wait to come together in physical worship with everybody. I cannot wait. But it's time to tear your own veil. It's time to take it off your face and tear it apart. God's saying, I've torn the veil for you. Why are you trying to hold on to it? What are you doing? I've torn the veil from top to bottom. Do you know what the cost was? Do you know what the cost was for me? It cost me myself. And we're putting these veils on. Friends, your hope and salvation is not going to be found in the encounter church community coming back together physically. That's not going to be enough for you. It is not going to be found in going back to your workplace and going, oh, finally, my old desk. I have that sense of purpose again. It's not even found in your sense of mission. It's God. It's always been God. That is the only place you will find a true sense of purpose. But you only find it when you lose control. He has saved us through his son. He's filled us with his spirit. He's bringing us together. He's calling us home. But home is not physically together. Home is the presence of God. And God has offered us a way near to him, even as our souls are desolate with longing. We cannot afford to come together physically only to get comfortable spiritually. We need to live lives with torn veils, lives that are wild with the presence of God, hearts on fire for Jesus, with ears that beg to hear the voice of God and voices that sing his praises. The world needs your fire. God has put a purpose in you. God has put a fire in you. But if you put that veil on, you're saying, God, I, I, I can't have it all. I don't, I don't want it all. That sounds hard. Yeah, it's the hardest, greatest life you've ever lived in your life. You have never tasted anything like this. When we have an encounter with Jesus, it is like we taste and see that the Lord is good. And a taste, like those little sample platters you get at Costco. You taste it and you're meant to see if it's good. And, you know, it's not always good. But when you taste that encounter with Jesus, you know that the Lord is good and you hold on to it. The world needs your face. They need your fire. You can't keep that veil on there because you need to take that veil off. They need to see you reflecting God's glory without a veil. Like Moses, you're going to need to take the veil off. What do we know? We know that the greatest hope of a Christian during COVID-19 has been that we know where our eternities are which means that our mission is to help others know this. The veil was torn apart. Jesus has guaranteed that you can come together with God. So it's time, church. It's time to throw away your veil. Time to stop controlling your lives and say to God, I am yours. Everything in me is yours. Now, as as we finish off tonight, for real this time, I just want to tell you, Sometimes in worship, there is this moment with a capital M, and I see you, you're sitting there on your couch, friends, you, you probably got kids around you if you're at home with your kids, you're probably like struggling to stay focused, you got your phone in one hand, you know, I get it, I get it, put it down for a second, because God is taking you on a journey for a moment, just hold. God is taking you on a journey, if you're somebody who has never known Jesus before, can I tell you this moment's for you? Because God is a loving Father who wants nothing more than to welcome you home with open arms. And you're saying, I have questions. And he's saying, that's okay. I've got answers. Ask me your questions when you have time. You say, I've, I've got doubts. He's like, that's all right. I've got answers. I've got the very presence of God ready for you. You say, I've got problems of my own. I don't even know if you want me, God. God says, I love you. I'm your loving Father. I'm waiting for you to come home. And that's going to be your response tonight. If you have never said yes to Jesus as your personal Messiah, your Savior, the Lord, the God, the King of your life, I know that's a lot of titles, but he's all of those things, then tonight is your night. I want to say a really quick prayer. I'm going to leave a line after each, and I want you to repeat it after me, just at home by yourself. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I give my life to you. I turn away from all my sins and follow you. I'm tearing the veil off my life. Take all of me. Lord, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit and forgive me? I receive your forgiveness. I receive your spirit. And I walk as a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Hey, if that's you, we'd love you to click the button that says, I've made a decision to give my life to Jesus today. That is the best decision you've ever made in your life. And we want to get behind you in this because, again, Christians don't do life alone. We do it together in this community. But for many of you, you're listening tonight and you're like, Mike, I'm already a Christian, but there's a veil on my face. I'm holding it. There's something in your life right now. God wants to identify that for you. Maybe you've already been convicted during the message, but God is speaking to you right now. He's saying it's time. It's time to tear that veil up. What is it? What is it that's holding you back from full abandonment, from full passionate worship, from a life fully lived for God? Tonight, that's you. Let me pray for you if that's you. If you're there at home and you know that's you, you've got the advantage of that. There's probably not many people with you this week. This is a good week for it. This is a good week to be convicted. Have your hands out in front of you in a posture of receiving, just like this. And I want to pray for you to receive the presence of God in this moment. God, I just want to lift those people to you right now, that they know you've torn the veil. Maybe they know all the good theology. They know they've come fully into the presence of God, that the Holy Spirit has filled them, all the good God stuff. They know all of that, but they're not living it. They've put that little veil up in their life. Maybe it's a lifestyle choice. Maybe it's it's something in their heart or something they believe that they just need to repent of right now. So Jesus... You who are so gracious, you who bridge that gap between God and us. Lord, would you just release them, heal them from that in Jesus' name. Father, I'm praying release right now on people. There's something in their lives that's holding them back from fully giving themselves over to God. And God, you're longing to use them to the way they were born to be used. And right now, the chains are being broken Church all across lounge rooms, all across Australia, chains are being broken as people are giving their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. Lord, we just praise you. We thank you so much. We celebrate what you are doing in people's lives. You are the God of freedom. You're seeing salvation rise in people and you're seeing freedom rise in people. We praise you for that. We praise you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, we're going to worship together, church. We're going to worship together. Why don't you lift your, uh, lift your voices, lift your hands, stand to your feet, and let's worship boldly together in our living rooms. Jesus, we Jesus Christ. 
Hey, church, uh, as we come to a finish, it's been it's been awesome celebrating our birthday together. And I'm going to pray a blessing in a sec. So just hang up for that. And, of course, afterwards, we'd love you to grab some dinner, jump into a Zoom room, get to know some people there. It's a great way to forge community. And then hang around 8 o'clock tonight, Instagram Live on the Encounter account. We'll be, we'll be going live, Jen and I, and, and talking about some of our highlights from a couple of years of ministry and church planning. We'd love your questions. We'd love to hang out with you guys in that time. But let me offer a blessing as we finish. May you know the abiding love of God the Father, who has moved heaven and earth, to bring you into relationship with him. May you know that Jesus has saved you and has died for you. May you know the love and peace of the Holy Spirit filling you and spurring you on to love and good deeds. And may you not want to give up the habit of coming together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Go and let your Sundays invade your Mondays and we will catch you next week. See ya.
together. Come together. Come together. London.